This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 65, recorded on December 17th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. This is the podcast known as TWIP. It is. This Week in Parasitism. Correct. The last episode for 2013. Sad, but true. Because you're going to India tomorrow. I'm going to India. But we might not have recorded another one anyway. Probably not, but maybe so. So I'm looking out the window right now, Vincent, and I can't see my house from here. (laughs) You can't normally anyway. I (laughs) usually can see at least where I live in New Jersey. I can't even see out the window anymore. You see that big building that's that's going up? You can't see that? I can't see anything. It's a complete whiteout. Yeah. We're having a snowstorm. I just realized that. When we record, you get to look out the window. I do. And I get to look at so the wall. So what's the last, what's, when we looked out before, we were doing a twiv the other yeah. day, and we saw the blue angels fly by. We did. And it was some, crazy. And some hawks chasing them, right? It was, yeah, that's right. Trying to keep What kind them. of hawks do we have? Red tails? We have red tails. We also have um, peregrine falcons. They live in the bridge? They do. And on the palisades. Hmm. The bridge being the George Washington Bridge? The, the, the George Washington this, Bridge. This uh, studio, which is located in... Columbia University right. Medical Center exactly. is very near the George Washington Bridge. the hustle bridge. and the bustle of Upper Manhattan. So the bridge is at 178th Street, right? and we are at 168th That's Street, exactly 10 right. blocks south. And the beauty of this is... Which is half a mile, by the way. Both of us live in New Jersey, so if we want to know how the traffic is, all we have to do is look out the window and we can check it out before we get into our cars and drive off. The thing is, the Dixon, blue. if there is traffic, what can we do about it? <laughs> we can stay here and have another podcast. <laughs> we can't do anything about it. That's true. That's true. Now, uh, before we talk about parasites, right? what are you going to do in India? Why do you need Why to Why am there? I going to India? You were just there. I, I was, actually. You were here this year, right? Uh, As he takes off his no, glasses. I no, didn't, I didn't go to India this year. <laughs> no? no? Last year? I've been to India. This will be my fourth trip. Why are you going? Um, well, I was invited to give a talk, uh, one of the keynote addresses, at the annual Indian Institute for Architecture. Now, the, last, the first mm-hmm. time I went to India, I went to Bangalore to do the same thing. I gave a talk in the 2008 annual um, meeting of the Indian Institute for Architecture, and I talked about vertical farming, and someone was in attendance at that meeting and thought it would be a great idea to include me into their urban uh, sessions. So Mm -hmm. they're having uh, two or three sessions on urban life, and um, the idea of vertical farming has now caught on in many places, not in India yet, but it's it's probably going to happen. Don't they have so lots of farmland there? They have lots of farmland, but it's all failing, unfortunately. Why is know? that? Well, we're going to talk about that, actually, as part of these papers. They have too many going to parasites? Reviews. No, they have climate change issues. Really? Huge climate change issues. And one of the biggest is the monsoons. All right, so monsoon is a uh, term applied to an annual rain event. Is, okay, um, it starts in April. Monsoon. Okay. Yeah, and it and continues on through August. Usually. It's a long time. It is. And, and it gets very wet. How much rain falls? Extremely in? wet. And not only that, well, a lot. <laughs> the answer is a lot. <laughs> it's a very uh, quantitative answer. Yeah, I thought you'd like that answer. Um, enough rain falls to supply precipitation in the Himalayas for the glaciers. Monsoon but, is now used to describe seasonal changes in atmospheric circulation and precipitation associated with the asymmetric heating of land and sea. Oh, you're reading now from, what is that, Wikipedia? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so the, the monsoons have been occurring for, well, centuries, ever since there have been Himalaya mountains to begin with. Mm-hmm. Pardon me, I have a slight a remnant of a like cold. some water for that? Oh, no, I think I'm fine the way I am, thank okay. you. Okay. 
But I'm going to talk in low, dulcet tones rather than my usual animated self because it's just that kind of day outside. It's like an FM radio day. <laughs> Everyone will be sleeping shortly. That's right. We're, <laughs> we're here at the TWIP studios. and No, no, I can't do that either. So the, the problem with farming in India and Southeast Asia and China those are the big areas that are impacted by the monsoons, and that includes Thailand, too, and Cambodia, and Laos, and Malaysia, and Myanmar, and Singapore, although it does rain every day in Singapore because I was there and it rained every day, um, is that the weather patterns are changing. All right, so these weather patterns are not conducive to agriculture, that's what you're saying? Well, they are someplace, but not there anymore. What I'm saying is that the rains come early, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're intense, and they leave early. So you could grow rice, right? So two things happen. No. Well, you can. Of course you can. But you need other things, too. Sure. but so you can't grow corn? They don't grow corn. Well, they do grow some corn in well, what India. What kind of vegetables do you want to grow that you can't grow in India, for example? Not that you can't grow. Well, wheat is one of their big crops. Okay. Wheat. Yeah, you have to Huge. make the chapati with that. That's mm. right. All their breads, the naan and the dosa. <laughs> that, I'm telling you, the food in India is absolutely good. The bread is very good. It's unbelievable. And it goes so well with all kinds of other dishes like tikka masala and all that stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. Going to gain trip. some weight? I hope not. Now I'm going to be doing some hiking up in Uti and places like that. So I maybe we, I hope we see you again. Uh, you will. Of course you will. Well, we'll see. I hope I see me too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Vincent, You'll be back Vincent when? Vincent dotes January on me and worries about me. <laughs> 27th? Uh, we're coming back on the 4th of January. That's two days after my birth anniversary. Wow. I'm going to be 61. Wow. wow. Which is quite younger than you. Quite a bit. 12 years? That's right. Hmm. Exactly. I'm not that much younger. No. You know, we're both, I, we're I think both people listening men. right now will, will probably want us to stay on track here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so within, within a lifetime of living in India and in South Asia, the weather patterns have actually changed. They result in more intense flooding. They result in more intense droughts that are longer lasting. And because the water doesn't actually get a chance to soak in as much as it could with a gentle rain that fell over a longer period of time, the groundwater, the water table, is, is affected. And they depend on that water at the end of the growing seasons to irrigate their fields when it doesn't rain any longer. And that's not been happening lately. So they've had major failures of wheat crops rice crops, and other kinds of vegetables as well. And, and what, do you, what do you think their biggest problem is in those areas, Vincent? What do you mean? I don't know if the question... Altogether, what's their biggest problem that they're facing as the result of climate change? They cannot feed their population. So what do you think those farmers are doing? Fertilizing? They're moving to the city. Oh, because they don't have work. Right. What are they doing in the city? That's a very good Who knows? question. Well, they're not doing much because there's not a lot of work for them. So Sounds they're accumulating lots of out-of-work farmers. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the yeah. issues that this meeting is addressing. What, what can we do with all of these people that have now accumulated in our cities? Put them to work in a vertical farm, skilled? right? Well, we could do that. Well, I would like to see that happen, of course. I think it sounds to me that India is the next vertical farm frontier. I would love that to happen. Because you could get these farmers and say, look, around the corner I have a farm, and they That's would right. look at you and said, what are you talking about? Exactly. And you would show them, and they could work there. That's all true. You could save India. I don't want to save India. I don't think They I would could. put you on a pedestal. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> next to Ganesh? Do you think they'd put me next to Ganesh? <laughs> Ganesh. <laughs> you know, why are you laughing? Uh, you, uh, I was going to make a joke, but I'm not. No, you shouldn't. I am Ganesh. I look just <laughs> like... You look just like... You know what? Because he knows it's an elephant and he thinks I'm overweight. And I am overweight, but I'm not that much overweight anymore because... I think you have a sense of humor. Well, I'm trying. Can I um, Working launch us into our need. TWIP? Yes, of course. You put a paper on my desk. I did. Well, actually, day. it wasn't a paper. It was an excerpt. It's a letter. It is a letter. To science. Right. And it's called more, The More Parasites, The Better. Right. And it struck me because there's a picture of a frog with... Six legs. Exactly right. two pairs of hind legs. How did that work? Does that have anything to do with the letter? Yes. It does? All right, so the letter is responding to an article uh -huh. that was published in August of this year right? called Climate Change and Infectious Diseases from Evidence to a Predictive Framework. Now, 
let's pause for a moment, Please. shall we? You have to explain this because I'm going to. I'm there's no life you. cycle here. I'm going to read the abstract first because this starts what? a conversation. The paper? Okay. Yeah, sure. So I noticed that Rich Ostfeld is one of the authors of this paper, and Rich Ostfeld and I are acquaintances, in fact, more than acquaintances. He works at the Institute for Ecosystem Studies up in Millbrook. He's New He's the yeah. director mm-hmm. of that institute. Why don't you go work up there? You know, at one point I almost did. I used to bring my... It's a think tank, right? uh, It's a think tank for ecology. And so Rick studies the relationship between the environment and parasitism. You know which parasite he works on by any chance? Nope. Would you like to guess? Yeah. Would I like to guess? Yeah, sure. All right, so this is... It's in Westchester County. Ticks? Keep going. You're right. Uh, Well, is that... If I'm right, I have to keep going. Yes, you do. Which disease does he study then? Lyme disease? Exactly. So he studies the relationship between the deer mouse, deer, deer ticks, and the forest. Hmm. He looks at the relationship between the growth of oak trees, the or acorns which fall off and supply food for the mice and for the squirrels, which are the intermediate host for this uh, tick. And then, of course, he studies the population of deer. All right, so when there are a lot of oak acorns, there's a lot of ticks, basically, right? Because there's a lot of mice. If you take away all the trees, the mice would go somewhere else. Or if they have a bad year, what if the rains yeah. don't come? What if there's a drought? What if there's a fire? What if there's a... He studies the, the, the fluctuations in the natural environment as it relates to the transmission of a disease that people can catch. Is that why it's important to study this? It's extremely this? important. And here are bona fide ecologists devoting their lives now not to studying the way food pyramids or food webs develop and you know some hypothetical thing that occurs in the middle of a Brazilian jungle, for instance, on the top of a, a diptrocarp, which is one of those tropical trees. He's studying real-life diseases that people can catch and the ecology associated with the transmission. So Rick, Rick and I have, have bonded at that sense of the word. And he used to actually teach one of the lectures in a course that I used to co-teach with uh, Steve Morse. Oh, cool. Called Emerging Infectious Diseases. Which I teach in now. You do. You've taken over. You've picked up the baton and kept running. I <laughs> run fast. I can't fast. even walk anymore. <laughs> you can't walk. So the point is that this, this article, mm-hmm. which was published in Science, which Correct. is a pretty good publication, right? Well, Says actually, the following. Uh, it's one of the luxury publications yeah, it's that's really, being boycotted well, by Randy Sheckman. Yeah, you know? well, you know what? He's not probably going to have much of an effect on that journal. <laughs> All right, sorry. Go ahead, Dixon. So let me read the abstract because I think it's important to get this right so that we can begin our discussion. Scientists have long predicted large-scale responses of infectious diseases to climate change, giving rise to a polarizing debate especially concerning human pathogens, for which socioeconomic drivers and control measures can limit the detection of climate-mediated changes. Climate change has already increased the occurrence of diseases in some natural and agricultural systems, which is very important to note here because a lot of the natural systems have been sacrificed in favor of agricultural systems. But in many cases, outcomes depend on the form of climate change and details of the host pathogen system. In this review, we highlight research progress and gaps that have emerged during the past decade and develop a predictive framework that integrates knowledge from eco-physiological and community ecology with modeling approaches. Future work must continue to anticipate and monitor pathogen biodiversity and disease trends in natural ecosystems and identify opportunities to mitigate the impacts of climate-driven disease emergence. In other words, this article is a generalist article which says that if you don't keep track of all of the environmental influences that alter the populations of hosts and parasites, then you will never, ever be able to develop predictive models for outbreaks of human diseases, be they caused by viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoans, helminths, etc., 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 as Yul Brenner used to say. So it's an incredibly important think piece to form the basis or the foundation for future research that requires, absolutely requires, bona fide ecologists working on diseases rather than some hypothetical or, or 
perhaps non-relevant ecosystem functions such as how does a grassland maintain its carbon balance with the atmosphere, etc. These are important issues, but the most important one now facing the human population, I think, is a dwindling natural system, an increasing built environment and agricultural systems, and the emergence of all these infectious diseases that we've chronicled on This Week in Virology and This Week in Parasitism. And you have another podcast called This Week in Microbiology, which also does the same thing at another level. So this is, I think, a critical issue that we have to start to pay more attention to. So what would you predict or what would one predict would be the effect of climate change on infectious diseases? Would it get more severe or less severe or both? Or not is, change either. The answer is yes. Okay, so it could go either way or not do anything. It depends on the pathogen. It depends on if it's a vector-borne infection. It depends on the area that you're talking about. It depends on how much host there is. It depends on how many parasites there are. So what you're saying is it's impossibly complicated and we could never figure it out. It, no, it's not impossibly complicated. <laughs> if you Let's say you had, let's say malaria. Yeah, okay. Uh, which is a tropical disease of course. because of the vector, right? And semi-tropical disease. And so if you increased temperatures, what would happen to malaria? Well, you would lengthen the growing season in marginal areas which now have a winter, spring, summer, and fall. Okay. If you only had a winter and, and summer with almost no transitions, you'd have a longer season to grow mosquitoes up in. And the people would be more, more active outside, too, because it would be a longer growing season. The agricultural interface would be more populated. And people would probably increase as a result of more food being made available, but they would also encounter more Why would more food be available? Because the agricultural system allows for that. Because well, the temperature... Course, and we know in India it doesn't, because as you just said... Well, those are places that we're really concerned about that, because even though mm-hmm. the temperature has... Uh, gone up in terms of uh, the Earth's temperature. It's mostly sea surface temperatures that have gone up, by the way. Um, The length at which mosquitoes can transmit malaria in some areas of Africa, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa, Mm. they have actually gone up. And you can measure this by altitude, Mm -hmm. all right? As the temperature in a certain region um, exceeds the or, or, or includes the temperature at which mosquitoes can reproduce at, and because there are temperatures at which they can't, the lower temperatures, of course, are the ones that we're talking about. As temperatures increase just a little bit, they can increase the range of mosquitoes hundreds of yards up that slope, and that's where the rice paddies are, and that's where the people are farming. So in addition, the current boundaries of malaria would move north and south that as it correct. got warmer. That is absolutely right. correct. And that's actually been All documented. Right. It has. I was yep. going to ask you that. So we it know has. these things. So documented. they have a figure here which is very cool because yeah. it has examples of animal parasite interactions for which studies have linked climate change to altered disease risk. Let's do that. Now look, black-legged ticks, right. which are the vectors of Lyme disease. Well, I wouldn't have called them that, but that's okay. They're exodious. Scapularis. Scapularis. Well, they call them black legs. Oh, okay. But that's their common name. That's true. That's true. Um, They grow, they show greater synchrony in larval and nymphal feeding in response to milder climates, leading to more rapid Lyme transmission. And this is milder, not not hotter climates. And that's a bacteria, right? It's a spirochete, correct? Borrelia. Borrelia burgdorferi, yeah, it's, right. a, it's a spirochete. So it's related to a syphilis organism. That's right. But it's transovarially transmitted from the mother tick to the egg, to the larva, to the nymph, to the adult. It's vertical transmission. Isn't They're, that unusual for a bacteria? Yeah. It really is. The next example <clears throat> is the Caribbean coral, Aha. which was affected by loss of symbionts. Ah, uh, Meaning what? No, no, I get to cruise you now. Come on. You, you've had your way with me on this week in virology. I got my turn now. <laughs> well, a symbiont is no. a, to, is are organisms that live together. Yeah, but in Carl, what would that symbiont be? A bacterium, probably, uh, right? I'm sorry, Vince. You'll have to come back next week. Not a virus. Uh, that's true also. It's not a virus. At least you knew that. It's not a bacterium? It's not a bacterium. What is it? It's an algae. All right. Affected by loss of symbionts and cilia infection algae. during the warm thermal anomaly in 2010 in Curacao. So they lost their symbionts as it warmed up, and they, they suffered because Do they need them. you know what it's them. called? It's called bleaching. 
Yeah, white plague disease. It's called bleaching. <laughs> that's right. Okay, this is the one I like because that's the f- six-legged frog. <laughs> it's a malformed leopard frog. It is. Ran of pipians. As a result of infection by the circarial stage uh, of the trematode R. ondantatre. Warming Close causes enough. nonlinear changes in both host and parasite that lead to market shifts in the timing of interactions. Right. So basically... It looks like a teratogenic effect that occurs in the tadpole which would result in a deformed adult. Now, so th- normally this, I don't understand this particular all right. one. Increased parasite. So why would warm temperatures affect this? Uh, well, so because the, the transmission zone would be longer and the frogs would be more active longer because they do hibernate during the wintertime. So this um, trematode, R. ondanta, yes. ondatre, yes. O-N-D-A-T-R-A-E, Right. Normally causes this malformation in the frog. It can cause that, and when you have Not high temperatures, then it happens more frequently exactly. because of the te- exactly. So how does it cause uh, well, this malformation? It's not obvious because uh, there was a uh, paper which I did refer to in one of our earlier discussions about ecology and parasitism by Andrew Blaustein, who is at uh, Oregon State University, and studied the effects of UVB radiation on teratogenic effects Mm -hmm. in frogs as they were developing from egg to tadpole to adult. And so what he did was he did a very good, simple experiment. He used lucite boxes that had the bottoms uh, missing Mm -hmm. that he could cover uh, clutches of eggs that frogs would lay along the shoreline of this little lake up in uh, the mountains areas of Oregon. And he would cover over half and leave half exposed and then measure the survival rate, and then measure the teratogenic rate. And, yeah, of course, the, the lucite box would intercept UV, the UVB yeah. radiation. And, right. and son of a gun, almost to a frog species mm-hmm. that bred in that lake, and there were several, and there were some toads also that bred there. If you expose them to the UVB radiation, they got the teratogenic effects, and if you mm. didn't, they didn't. Cool. But he concluded it must be UVB radiation that is causing these defects to develop, but... Associated with that in further studies, he found that in polluted waters, the rates of teratogenic effects were even higher than that. And so they started to look for chemicals like atrazine, for instance. Uh, Atrazine is a, uh, I think it's a fungicide. You could look it up right now. It's either a herbicide or fungicide. I think it's a fungicide. Um, That's very commonly used to um, protect wheat against wheat rust, and wheat rust is a fungus, so therefore it's a fungicide. So atrazine is a very commonly used um, chemical, agrochemical, as they're called. Mm -hmm. And if you look at where it's used, Vince, you're not going to believe this. I know you won't, but you can take a map of deformed frogs Mm -hmm. and a map of atrazine use and superimpose them and have a one-to-one correlation. So what would you conclude from that? Hmm. No, I, I, no, no, you would. I, I would. know you would because everybody not, else did too. Atrazine does not cause frog malformation. It does not, but it's, it's associated. It's an association. It's an association. So you have to go in the lab and try to You do, you it do, you do, you do. And you know what it does? It kills the parasite? No. It, it makes the parasite it live. It immune inhibits the frogs. And that allows the parasite to cause the defects. Okay. There you go. It's a secondary effect. It's, it's almost like frog AIDS. So I just looked up <coughs> Riberoia ondatre, yeah. Yeah, 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 which is yeah, this yeah. trematode. That's true. Uh, the exact mechanism of deformation has not been <laughs> determined, no, as you true. said, but it has been theorized that deformation results from mechanical disruption of the cells involved in limb bud formation. Isn't that interesting? So that I must think, occur um, in the egg or in the tadpole. Correct. Now, Dixon... Um, so is that a teratogenic effect? Or the, is that hey, a, listen to this. The herbicide... <laughs> Atrazine has proven to weaken the amphibian's immune system, which causes frogs to become more prone to R on that tray. You actually know what you're talking about. Well, that's why you have me on this show. I'm, just <laughs> I'm always happy to be reinforced. Oh, well, I'm glad that uh, this nice. played out nicely then. So. The next one, can I tell the, the next one, or do you want to finish? No, something? no, no, please do. And then the next panel on this is infection of monarchs. Monarch. You know what a monarch is? Of course I do. There was a, no, they're, that's right. They're rulers of countries. Everybody <laughs> Butterflies by the protozoan O. Electroshira. Is that named after Wally Shira? 
No. Well, the astronauts increases in parts of the U.S. where monarchs breed year-round as a result of the establishment of exotic milkweed species on, uh, in milder winter climates. Did you know that monarch butterflies will only breed where there are milkweed plants? No, no ah. idea. Right. And did you also know <laughs> that monarchs migrate? I think I knew that. They're like birds; they Back migrate the, south. Yeah. So where do you think they end up? No, Mexico. They migrate to Mexico. They migrate to Mexico. It's a long way. It is a long way because we have monarchs here in New Jersey. <laughs> monarchs. They go down to they Mexico. Live two years. They what? Monarch butterflies live two. Two years. years? That's a long time uh, for an insect. So they go down there for what part of the year? They winter over. And they're, they come back? They're down there now. And they come back? Oh, yes. I forget no. the name of the town. I believe you could look it up. You can look it up. Vince has the power. Nah, that's okay. I don't I'm just get sitting the... here knocking these things off the top of my head, but that's Vince great. has got the power. No, it's great. So, so I think basically, it's in... with milder climates, you get exotic milkweed species. Ah. And then they... they uh, and they... Foster the transmission of a protozoan yeah. infection, which then kills off the monarchs. The last one is wait, 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 shari, wait. shari. No, no, don't go fast. You're going too fast because there's some fascinating it's biology here. It's this exciting, is wonderful. There's another monarch, like butterfly. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that's called? Viceroy. Yes. Isn't it? A Isn't that another species? leader for a country? Yeah. <laughs> well, which one mimics the other, right? Uh, viceroys are much less. In population than monarchs. Which one is, tastes bad to the bird? The monarch butterfly. So the viceroy imitates the monarch, even though it doesn't taste it's, bad. It's biomimicking. Yeah. Right? Do you actually believe that? No, I think God did all that. <laughs> no, that's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. Huh? Has it been shown that yeah, it birds has. will not eat monarch? Will well, once, eat it, once it takes a bite of the monarch butterfly and gets a bad taste in its mouth, it avoids all butterflies that look like that. How long does a bird live? It depends on the birds. Some birds live a long time. Birds like, that eat monarchs like, and viceroys. Oh, I, you know, those are varied. They're insects. I just wonder how much memory there is in the bird population. That's all. Oh, right. You know, oh, if I this bird, a bird well, X doesn't eat any more monarchs. Remember, they migrate south every year. Yeah, anyway, it's I believe it. It just seems weird. <laughs> anyway, what about the viceroy? Well, it, it benefits from looking a little bit yeah, like sure. the monarch. Okay. And so that means that the birds are actually feeding based on what they see rather than what they smell or what they taste. Because when they see a monarch butterfly, they go right yeah, for but it. This implies that the bird remembers. Well, is that true? The, the individual bird does remember. I'm getting way out of my comfort zone here. Well, you knew. Okay. So. Did, where'd you go to school, Vince? <laughs> what part of school? <laughs> where'd you go to college? Cornell University. And who was the most famous person at Cornell Tom University? Tom Eisner. And what did he do? He worked on insects. And other things, too. He did? Yeah, sure. And he had a wonderful demonstration. He wouldn't talk to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, he didn't know you. He would have talked to you. He was a wonderful guy. So he had a fantastic Remember demonstration. Remember we uh, put links to his his recordings a couple years, months ago? Of course we did. Ago, or, So, yeah. you know, he was on a Discovery show once, and he showed the the exquisite distinction between life forms that a spider can detect. He took two moths. They looked identical, but one was a different species than the other. Mm. And one moth tastes very good to this particular spider. He said, you want to see? He turns around, there's the spider web, throws the moth into the spider web, out comes the spider, takes a bite, wraps it all up into his cocoon and carts it back off into the storage bin. Then he has this other moth that looks just like the other moth, but mm -hmm. it's not. He says, only spiders can tell us the difference. Watch what happens now. He throws the moth into the web. The spider comes out, takes a bite, and cuts the web out to allow the moth to escape. Yeah, you told us that once. It's okay. So it's the same way with monarch butterflies and viceroys, and there are lots of other those kinds of associations which uh, the the majority benefits the minority. Okay, so it's called a balanced polymorphism. We know these things from our own studies of diseases like sickle cell anemia and malaria. Right. That's a balanced polymorphism, too. All right. The last example is a, a nematode that infects caribou and reindeer. Okay. <laughs> Which? So the a, infection risk of these. Called? It's called? O. Gruneri. Gruneri. O. Gruneri. Do you know the first O? 
What does the O stand for? I can tell you. Would you like me to find out? I would. All right, look. It's not Opus Dorcas, is it? It's Ostertagia. Ostertagia. It's a nematode. It's a nematode. It's Oster- a nematode. Infection risk yeah. may be reduced during the hottest part of the Arctic summer ah. as a result of warming, which leads to two annual transmission peaks rather than one. Ah. The hottest part of the Arctic summer, which is still frozen, right? Does it no, thaw? It no, does thaw. Well, it's thawing, Vince. It's thawing. That's the one up north, right? The Arctic summer. Yeah, it's thawing. And the tundra is thawing. And you know what's going to happen when it thaws out completely? Is it going to one day? Maybe. The poles are going to melt, right? It's going to release tremendous quantities of methane. And we should capture it and burn it. If we could. It's too generalist. It's all frozen in there? Yeah, it is. Clathrates? Is Is that what they're called? Clathrates. 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 So these are examples of how climate change can affect host parasite interactions. You bet. So that's what this whole article is about, predicting these kinds of Correct. effects, right? So you, yes, but you'd have to know the specific example in order to study the conditions under which they are discouraged or encouraged in terms of their transmission cycles. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it means that if you want to maintain a high level of public health for people, what do you have to do, Vincent? You have to train more ecologists. It's kind of a self-serving thing. For people? you damn right it is. No, no, Aren't no. We For the ecologists. About- no, no, it's not. It means that every, every department of public health throughout the world should have a branch of ecology associated with it. Mm-hmm. So the CDC should have ecologists? They do have ecologists. I'm sure they do, now. Right? They, That took them a long time to come to that, but they do have them. All right. And it's taken ecology a Did long time. Did you notice, time. by the way, that all these examples were parasites? Well, that's what they're trying to point out here. What about bacteria, fungi, viruses? Oh, you mean eukaryotic parasites? <laughs> well, no. One of them was Lyme disease. That's not a eukaryote. Come on. It's one out of them. But well, most of them were parasites. Uh, some of eukaryotic them parasites. I have one that Arturo Casadeval quotes, that as the climate is warming, the fungi are getting better at growing at higher temperatures and thereby causing human diseases more often. Because normally fungi like to grow at lower temperatures, you know? Some of them. And so as the globe is warming, his argument is we're seeing more fungal disease because they're adapting to higher temperatures. You could say that, but I mean, what about the fungi that are important for recycling nutrients in a tropical rainforest? Mm. And let me just give you the. I mean, I know this is a little bit off the subject, but we never go off subject. We, okay, fine. So if you're a leaf on a dipterocarp, which is one of these what tropical is a dipterocarp, a tree. It's a generalist term for the kinds of trees that you find. I like that. If you're a leaf on a dipterocarp, that's right, a good title. If you're a leaf on a. <laughs> if you are a, a leaf, leaf on a dipterocarp. D i p t o. Dipterocarp. Dipterocarp. Right. Okay, what happens if you're... It sounds like if you give a mouse a cookie. Remember those books? (laughs) If you give a moose a muffin. You don't know those books? Nope. That wasn't how I was brought up. You missed out in your life. I did. Isn't it obvious? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. If you're a leaf in a dipterocarp, carp, what happens? Okay, but I want to compare and contrast temperate zone forests with tropical forests. And what is the difference? There's a big difference. And that is recycling nutrients... All right? So right now we're in the wintertime, aren't we? And all the leaves have fallen off you the trees. You just told us, didn't you? So, yes. And so what's happening to those leaves as we speak? They're, well, they're frozen. They're not right. decomposing because it's well, too cold, right? Well, that's right. The that's composition a, is only in the exactly spring, right. summer, and fall, correct? That's exactly right. And how it makes long, great dirt, by the way. It does. And so if you're a leaf on a maple tree and mm-hmm. you fall into the forest floor, it takes you almost a whole year to rot. Right. But if you're a leaf on a dip or a carp, because they're in the tropics? Several weeks. Yeah. And the difference is that recycling of nutrients in the tropics is dependent on fungal infection, fungal growth. Yeah. Whereas in temperate zones, it's bacterial. Right. So the detritivores in a temperate zone are bacterial. The detritivores in the tropics are fungi. So what happens when a forest fire occurs? If you go to the temperate zone forests, some of those Detritivores are deep into the soil, and they're not affected at all by fire. But if you go down to the tropics, and a fire sweeps through a tropical zone, it kills off all the surface fungi, and the recycling mechanism is disconnected from the uh, forest. Okay. And as a result, you can have 
maybe 10 or 20 years before the forest can repair itself. Whereas in a temperate zone, it can occur very quickly. So those are the big differences. And you can Got apply it. that same logic to parasites and to all kinds of other things too. Now in this letter that yes. you put on my desk, yes. they say in this review, which we mentioned, the, the science review, where they're talking about the effect of climate change on infections, yes. they say they ignore an important problem. The loss of parasite biodiversity could have dire quantity consequences to ecosystems. This is In fact, the, the title of this letter is, read it. The more parasites, the better? With a question mark. Right. So it begs the question, what good is a parasite? I remember way back in the <laughs> yeah. beginning. Yeah, we did that. You used to say yeah. parasites are important to control populations. Very important. Very important. So in my course mm -hmm. that I used to teach here for the uh, ecology one-on-one students, Right, mm -hmm. I would often ask them to write me a one pager, mm -hmm. and the title of that one pager is "What good is a?" And then I let them fill in the blank. What good is a tree? What good is a flower? What good is a bacterium? What good? They is had to a, put a living thing in there. They did. They had not to like a, a car. Not like a Prius. No, not, not like that fraudulent car that I drive. I didn't say it. <laughs> no, of course not. But I get you, yelled at. When you've I say convinced it. me now that I, no, you haven't actually. But I, I love. I the car. never convince you of anything. <clears throat> yes, you do. do. I? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. So a you lot. put in some living thing. So you put in some living mm -hmm. thing, and, you, and then you look up. Well, what good is a crow? Uh, remember when the West Nile virus first hit this country? It wiped out about 90% of the free-range crows. Yeah. What were the ecological consequences of that? Dixon, everything has a place, You know it right? does. You know it does. It's all like a, it's a, like a Swiss watch it with multiple It has evolved parts. to be that way, right? It's like it a puzzle. All the parts work exactly together. Right. Exactly right. You take one out. Exactly. Or you alter the, con you alter the amount of. Yeah. And the, the bubble increases for this and decreases for that. But the, the only thing you could get rid of with no consequence is people. <laughs> I don't think so. We no, your microbiomes would be absolutely... The, the earth would flourish. They would be so disappointed. The earth would flourish without us. Well, the earth will flourish Look, with let's us. say you take away mosquitoes, you have yeah. dire consequences, right? I think so. So what consequence would you have of taking away people except that animals and other life would flourish? Let me recommend a book for you. It's called The World Without Us by Alan Weissman. That book tells all about what would happen yeah, when we disappear. But what does he know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to ask him. I'm not going to speak for Alan Weissman. Is it just um, no, it's, speculation or is it based on It's all speculation because we haven't gone away, obviously. A World Without Us? Yeah, The, the World Without Us. Okay. It's published by St. Martin's Press. Oh, that's your press. Yep. Two famous authors. Well, one at least, if Alan Weissman. <laughs> I just think that without us... I mean, we don't fit into any food web, right? You think? Yeah, what food web do really? we fit into? Oh, I you mean, mean something eats us? What do you no. think a detritivore is? Come on. Look, what do we contribute? I mean, we grow our own food, but that's for us. It's not for anyone else. That's not always the case. We hunt a lot of things also. We alter balances. But I'm, what I'm saying we is sure without do. our impinging, yes. things would grow properly and naturally. If you want to look at it that so way. So no species on Earth would go away without us, except maybe the domesticated animals, right? All your microbiome would disappear. You know yeah, but animals out, there, animals out there have microbiomes. Not ours. Oh, okay, I got you. Right. All right, that's fine. Yeah. All of our domestic animals would die. Yeah, but we made those to begin with. So. That's fine. We didn't make them. They, we we they evolved them. in our presence. <laughs> right. We selected them, but they, they evolved on their so own. So why is this guy saying that uh, the parasites are needed for ecosystems. Tell us a little bit more. I have a feeling sure. that you can wax poetic sure. on well, this. Well, I'm going to, well, you know, I can't really think of a poem that goes with this, but... <laughs> well, that was a figure of speech. I understand that. So what I'm going to suggest, and I've already talked about this before, but we'll talk about it again, is that without disease, all right, without disease, and without selection for resistance to disease, mm -hmm. populations would fluctuate according to natural resources availability mostly and the dire consequences of environmental change that relates okay. to uh, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and things of this sort, floods. But if you superimpose disease on a population, various diseases, 
multiple diseases that are constantly testing the waters, constantly probing to see whether you've got the right MHC2 complex or whether you've got the right toll-like receptors or whether you've got the right... I mean, I can talk like this now because of all the experience you've given me on the This Week in Virology show. So now I, I'm more aware of our innate immune system and our inducible immune system. Do you and, remember these things? Well, some of them. Yeah, I, do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't keep it all in my head all at once, but I've got a computer just like you do. So the point is that they all play a role in selecting organisms that are the most fittest. Mm-hmm. The most fittest. Yeah, the most the fittest. fittest. The fittest, the fittest for that particular yeah. environmental situation. And the environment in this case is the consequence of acquiring diseases that are infectious. They actually give a few examples and they so, cite papers. There's a do you whole, want to hear them? I nah, do. I do. Okay. No, I do, I do. We can mention them. But I wanted to go back to the original yeah, sure. population ecology sure. data. Okay, so the population ecology is relatively new. And there was a wonderful book produced by two people, Andrew Wartha and Birch. Andrew Wartha and Birch, they were, I believe, both from Australia, although one was from India originally. They published a book on the ecology of populations of animals. And it was the first time that ecologists ever started to pay attention to how populations responded to things, didn't matter what, right? And it took them an even longer time to come to realize that these populations are responding not just to fluctuations in temperature, not just fluctuations in humidity, the amount of uh, moisture, they're responding to the diseases that they acquire, which are in turn influenced by those things that I just mentioned. So this is a multiple layer cake that you have to now take into consideration. It's a multiple variable equation. And it's constantly changing. So if you go back to the original publication that says, well, you can describe all of ecology if you can define what the niche is, the essential niche, and the uh, sort of the progenitor of the modern definition of what a niche is was uh, put forth by G. Evelyn Hutchinson, who was a Yale biologist who was given credit for establishing the Yale School of Forestry, by the way. I actually had the privilege of meeting him once. And again, I've mentioned this before on our show, but it's good to bring it up again now. You can start to put things into context. All right, Andrew, Arthur, and Birch, pay attention to populations. G. Evelyn Hutchinson defined the niche, and that includes chemical, physical, biological aspects. And, you, and by the way, he says you can never do that because it's just too complicated. But you have to think about it anyway. And the more, the more you think about it and the more you can measure things, the more precise you can be with regards to ecological process as it affects a population. I never forgot that, although I never became drawn to population ecology or to the mathematical aspects of all of this, because there's a lot of math involved in all of this, by the way. And you can imagine how that would play out on a big supercomputer where you've got all these variables all at once changing. And then you can predict, if you knew all of that, how much of this and how much of that and how much of those there would be. And as a result, you'd be able to make predictions about the future. Whenever you got those conditions, watch out for this. You remember what I said about West Nile, right? Because the moment the temperature goes up above 90 degrees yeah. for more than a week and you've got West Nile in the area, you're going to get a transmission to a human. And it's probably because of the viral titers and the uh, mosquitoes go up because of the temperature, okay, for every... 10 degrees, you get a doubling of the biochemical reaction and so on. But, of course, you also argue that the water availability is part of the story, right? Oh, sure. When the birds have no water exactly to drink. Exactly right. Exactly they, right. And all of that has played sorry, out. Sorry. Wait a minute. How does it work? No, when right. There's, when there's little or no water, then the pollution-loving mosquitoes take over, and those are the ones that transmit West Nile from birds to people. Yeah, they stop eating. They stop biting birds, and they bite That's people. That's correct, because the birds fly away because the That's water your theory. is somewhere else. Well, it's actually been proven i haven't been disproven let's put it that way <laughs> <laughs> what's what re, re, comes back to my mind is the twip we did about how uh when when the investigators added uh, grasshoppers i think it was oh, yeah, to yeah, the yeah, yeah, um, yeah, to, trout. to the trout yeah and that's right they had they were infected which is why they <laughs> the could metamorph they, they were, there was an yeah metamorph. and the trout and then the trout stopped eating <clears throat> on right. what was on the bottom of the pond and 
it messed up and the changed whole, the whole ecological yeah. world setting. That's exactly so. Right. That was like a little controlled study, but perhaps you think on the whole world level that since this we're re- since we're recalling over. so much of what we've already talked about, I think I think we should title this episode "Let's Twip Again Like We Did Last Summer." <laughs> <laughs> we only that was the only thing we recalled. That's true. If you're a leaf on a dipterocarp, carp, I like that. If you're a leaf on a so what they say, can I can I just sure. quote a few of these? Because every time do. I do, you go off and it's no, no, great. No, 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 I want you to. I want you to. So, for example, increased parasite richness, reduced transmission of this trematode to the to the frogs that causes their them to have six legs. Okay, yes. increased parasite richness. <clears throat> Which could be accompanied by, which could be caused by high temperatures. Is that the idea? Could be. You get more nutrients could be. and could more be. richness in could parasites. Be. This decrease in disease risk may be due either to increased parasite competition or right. anti-parasite immune responses. Ah. So you, you stay tuned, kids, because we're going to tell you which one it is, but it's going to take some time. What, what do you mean by that? You have to do some more experiments. You have to do oh, some yes, more observations. Course. Pathogens can also have a mediating effect on interspecific competition between shared hosts, right. as in the case of these lizards in the Caribbean, which right. exclude sister species, except when their comp- competitive ability is diminished <laughs> by the presence of a plasmodium. Bingo. Wow. Isn't that incredible? You couldn't design this, like Beatrice no. Hahn said. You couldn't design you this. You couldn't make it up. That's right. Parasites likely mediate such interactions largely through immune costs. Right. Which hosts trading off resource use between immune responses and reproduction and growth. See, in ecology, you always think about the budgets, all right? It's always about energy budgets. Mm-hmm. And energy drives the system, Is of course, it drives everything. So, so this is, listen to their conclusion. Please, Although please. some virulent parasite populations may increase with climate change, yes. we anticipate that the loss of parasite biodiversity will result in more widespread and unpredictable threats to ecosystem health. We therefore call for further research into parasite ecology and host parasite coextensions as tools for quantifying ecosystem wow. vulnerability to climate wow. change. Wow. That's a great point because... If what they're saying is true, then climate change, increased temperatures, will have an adverse effect on biodiversity. Right. That's what they're saying. And that, that is, is the most... That is and that even, would be horrible. It's very important to have this biodiversity. It would be horrible. But, you know, if you go back in the history of the Earth and you look at when plants first arose on land and the kinds of forests that were available there, the diversity of life in terms of that was very low. Mm-hmm. Very low. And then as the temperature began to change and as the continents drifted apart and as the animal life diversified and as parasitism probably came, became more diverse, next thing you know, we had flowering plants and then we had dipterocarps and temperate zone trees and pine trees. We had gymnosperms, which were the most ancient of them. But there's a lot of things that occurred over time which probably resulted from an increase in biodiversity of the parasitism. Remember... About half of the life forms on Earth are parasites, and the other half are hosts. Are we considered parasites? If you ask Lynn Margulis that, she, she would have say said, yes. We yeah. are definitely the parasite of the Earth, but uh, of the Earth, yeah, but it was not a, of another living it was thing. A metaphor. Yes, of course, it was a metaphor. Now they cited a couple of very interesting papers. They did, didn't and they? one of them is cool here. All right, its its title is six costs of immunity to gastrointestinal nematode infections. Right. I have the abstract. Right Six ways to leave your lover. Was that the name of the song? No, there was more than that. <laughs> there must be 50. So basically they're saying here when you leave. have to defend yourself against an infection, yes, yes. there are many, many costs associated with it. This is true. All right. Like you get increased metabolic activity, reduced nutrient availability, uh, altered priorities for nutrient utilization. Right. The change in the pools of immune cells, immunopathology, right. Right. which we know. Right. So it's quite interesting that, you know, it's a balance. <sighs> oh, when yes. you When you activate your immune system, it's, a, it's really costing you a lot. You betcha. Because you take that away from something else. Yeah. Which is why it's always good to have a little bit of extra weight on yourself. I think that... Uh, <laughs> it is true, though, by you the should- way. You should keep that to heart. People who sure. are thin to begin with and yeah. catch an infectious disease don't <laughs> do very well in the long run because they run out of reserves mm-hmm. and they become cachectic. 
Do you know that term? Cachectic, yeah. Yeah. When, when you're you wasting away, right? Remember the term right? Well, that's an HIV infection often right. leads to cachexia at all later true. stages, this right? This is all true. And for schistosomes as well, by the way, it turns out. So very interesting stuff out there. And you, you have to take care of all of this. Now, I dare say that most ecologists are not well trained in immunology, and certainly most immunologists are not well trained in ecology, but here's an overlap mm-hmm. that's quite important. If you want to understand global processes at an ecological level that makes sense both at the molecular level and at the species and at the biome levels, you have to keep track of all of it. There's another paper which you might find Isn't interesting. Isn't this interesting? I mean, I think this is this is a tie. It's great. This is the stuff that we've been talking about in bits and pieces up to this p- particular episode. It's a great way to and end now the we year can, and to end a podcast, right? I think this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I finally got a chance to talk about something that I've been passionate about. This is a about. cool paper by yeah. your buddy Dobson oh, yeah. from Princeton. Yep. It's called Parasites Dominate Food Web Links. How about that? It says here that food webs are very incomplete without parasites. So what is a food web, Vince? Not the one that Eisner was throwing moths It's a spider web with with pieces of uh, insects in it. (laughs) Yeah, right. It's a food web for the spider. So there are two kinds of ways of looking at the flow of energy through life, right? One is a food chain. And the other is a food web. I think you need to explain them because... I'm going to. You are the master. Well, of the two people in the room, perhaps. No, not at all. <laughs> so here's my attempt at explaining but the you're, difference. But your... Your... Um, what's the uh, word for your... Watch out. Uh, ...is appreciated. Your X is appreciated. Your, it's the opposite of being arrogant. Ah. What's the... What? Humble. Your humbleness is appreciated. <laughs> Yeah, he said humbly. <laughs> One thing you are not is arrogant. That's true. I I don't have you the intelligence to be as that. No, no, no. You could be arrogant, but and many people are arrogant without cause to be arrogant. But you <laughs> this are, is true. So this That's is why I, like, arrogance. I enjoy podcasts oh, because good. I can push you around. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell right. me the difference between a web and a chain? I can. I can. So I will give you two examples and you can see for yourself. So a food chain is a simplified food web. So we begin with energy, right? So the energy comes in in the form of what? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I asked a question. (laughs) That was a question, Vincent, (laughs) not an answer. (laughs) Energy comes into what? Comes into the earth in the form of what? Sunlight. Excellent. Just stop right there. Okay. So you can measure energy in terms of what? How do we measure that energy? Photosynthesis, right? No, what is the unit that we use to measure the energy? Joules. That's energy. No. It's joules, right? Well, there's another calories. One. Yes, thank you. So you eventually, I get there. Calories. You no, know, listen. <laughs> this is Socratic. I know you knew the answer. <laughs> so it's calories. All right, the amount of calories coming into the Earth mm-hmm. at any one time okay. is like 2.5 calories per square centimeter per minute per second. Sorry, per second. If direct sunlight is coming onto the surface of the Earth, that's the energy formula, the budget for the earth. Plants can use about 2 to 5% of that. All the rest gets reflected back or bounced around. Mm-hmm. So of all of the energy coming in from the sun, we only capture about 2% through photosynthesis. You're absolutely right. So that's the first level of the chain, right? So let's, let's think about a very simple food chain that we're all familiar with. We'll take you to the Serengeti Plain in East Africa. Okay. The sun shines, the grass grows. That's the first level. Right. That first level is called primary producers. Right. Great. So if you have a producer, you can have a consumer. Someone has to eat the grass, right? Exactly right. right. <clears throat> so what do we call those animals? Those are grazers, right? That's right. That's right. Who eats the grass, by the way? In the Serengeti? Yeah. Name one. I bet you well, can. Well, hyenas don't. They eat meat, right? That's right. They're carnivores. Uh, porcupines, porcupines. There are no porcupines on the. <laughs> <laughs> My zoology is very. That's a poor. too Jersey thing to say. You know. I had this discussion no. yesterday at our textbook really? meeting about zoology because right. I asked one of my co-authors, "Are all?" mammals vertebrates and she looked at me and she said did you ever take zoology i said no all well, animals are vertebrates it's nothing aren't they? to be ashamed of are all vertebrates mammals. animals yes are all vertebrates animals yes they are but are all is a yeast an animal 
it's the animal mitochondrion, so it might. Yeah. What is an animal anyway? Well, that's right. It raises the question. But uh, we're drifting. I'm sorry, we're, we're drifting. drifting. We're drifting. So we're back to the Serengeti. So we have grass, which is Sun, eaten by porcupines. Light, grass, eaten by porcupines. Right. Well, porcupines. There are no porcupines there. <laughs> no. I don't know who would eat the grass. Who are the grazers in yeah. East cows. Africa? Cows. No. Well, they would here. Wildebeest. All right. There fine. are millions of them. Wildebeest eat the grass. Really, they're they're herbivores. They are right. zebras. Got it. And then the Elan. the lions eat the Wait, zebras and the wildebeest. I know I know a lot of these <laughs> Thompson's gazelles. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to. I right? get the picture. Okay. All right, so those are all grazers. Got it. Meaning that there's a tremendous amount of grass there, right? A huge amount to support that huge. biomass. Yeah. Okay. So who eats the grazers? Vince? Lions and tigers and okay. bears. There are no bears in Africa. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Is that true? There are no bears in Africa. This is true. And there are no lions in North America. Right? There used to be tigers, though. Although we have there used to lions. be. We had saber-toothed tigers in the United States at one time. We have mountain lions, right? We do. And cougars. That's the same thing. All right. So then who eats the lions? No one. That's not true. That's the top of the food chain, right? Yeah. All right. So now but we cheetahs, have that chain, and there's a parallel chain, and together they make a web, basically. No, right? no, 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 no. That's the, the food chain is very simple: sunlight, grass, right, wildebeest, lion. lion. Sorry. That's so, it. what's the food web? Food web ah. includes the ecosystem, right? Well, let's take grass, right, and then let's take wildebeest, hartebeest, gazelle, zebra, mm -hmm. and spread an elephant. Spread them out. So there are many, many, many grazers feeding on the same grass. Is that correct? And each carnivore has its preference mm -hmm. for each one of those herbivores. And this creates a web. It's a simplified web, but yeah, it's still there. Yeah, because if you mess with one, you, you muck up the whole web, right? Exactly. Well, how, what happens when the grass fails? Well, then the lions suffer. Now, if you took the lions out of the equation... Oh. The ones below would overgrow, right? Oh, that's right? a great segue to my following example. Mm -hmm. Does everybody out there know who Aldo Leopold was? Yeah, well, no, I do it, because it, you've it been relates. harping on okay. him for a so while. So Aldo Leopold <laughs> began his career as a bounty hunter Now, he wrote wolves. The Silent Spring, right? No, that was <laughs> Rachel Carson. Gee. No, I'm just kidding. Do we have to start all over again? <laughs> Aldo Leopold. Okay, everybody wake up. <laughs> he, he wrote that big picture book that you loaned me. Yeah, The Sand County Almanac. Sand County Almanac. Yeah, but he didn't start out that way. He didn't start out as an ecologist. No? He started out as a bounty hunter. Hmm. He was hunting wolves. You know why? Because no. he thought if you hunt the wolves down, you will improve the deer population. That's true, right? No. What do you think happened? I guess it went the other way. Why do you think it went the other way? Because, I know you're pointing to pieces of paper. Parasites. 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 They got more diseases. They were, they were populations went up. The parasites home. Well, in. so initially the deer Bang. increased, but then yeah, they got but then they got into infested. big trouble. They got so into they big went trouble. down. So there's no balance. So ah, so the wolves balanced. The so population. you realize, yes, they called out all the sick animals because they were slow. Once he realized that, he switched his occupation. So that's why parasites are essential in here, food here, webs here. because so, they provide the balance. This is exactly right. And you could give me millions of examples. I right? could, but if you've ever been to Yellowstone Park. Uh -huh. The elk population was totally out of control. Why is that? Because there were no wolves. Who, what happened to the wolves? We killed them. We didn't like wolves. We thought they were dangerous. We thought they were killing our livestock. All right. So and we wiped out the wolves. probably some were. And the elk went out of control? The elk and the buffalo went out of control. And then what happened? Well, then they started to suffer from diseases like right. cervid uh, immune deficiency disease. Cool. And tuberculosis and Bangs disease, which is Brucella aboris. The all those uh, herbivore populations started to suffer greatly. Why? Because the sick animals were not being culled by the wolves. So they introduced wolves again, right? Oh, and another thing that happened, of course, was all the plant life changed because they overgrazed, and so that affected the rivers and the lakes. Mm -hmm. And everything was different as the result of the lack of a top carnivore. All oh, the world's a web, isn't it? The world is a web. The World Wide Web. Why That's do you think title. they call it that? That's a good title. <laughs> the uh, World so Wide Food Web. There's another paper here. It's called Host and Parasite Diversity Jointly Controlled Disease Risk in Complex Communities. That's just what you're talking about. Exactly right. right? This, is, this example is the frog with six legs, but yeah. 
Um, yeah. The World Wide Web. Should we call this episode that? Or is the that real World Wide Web. The World Wide Web. That's web. where they got the idea from. The real World Wide Web? Vincent, that's where they got the idea from. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Right. Uh, what, what have we missed? Uh, plenty. I mean, the details of all this, of course, is well, of in course, the reading. But we meant to give a global picture. And we gave a global picture. As a way of ending out 2013. There's a point of this. The point of this is that all life on Earth behaves this way. Isn't that intriguing? We haven't talked about viruses much. We but have not, but they're, inf- they're very they're important. Part of in this all whole of this. web. They're very important in all of those. And, and in fact, probably these elk, or whatever you, you change the balance of a web. Viruses are probably part of that as well. No question about it. So do people study this very much? They do. They do. There is a wildlife parasitology specialty, which uh, trains people to mm-hmm. pay attention to the wildlife parasites. And then someone is trained, and then they go out and they pick a web to study. And yeah, they do. Yeah. They spend years collecting data this and observing true. what happens. This is true. Do they ever perturb it? To see what the effect would be, you can't do that. It's not the way ecology usually behaves. Ecology usually behaves by observation, which is why it takes so long to discern what's going on. It's an observational science. Okay. And the more technical we can be with our observations, in terms of measuring temperature, humidity, uh, and climate change issues relate to those things. You know, they look at tree ring growth as an indicator for temperature change. They look at ranges mm-hmm. of things as an imp- indicator for temperature growth. I talked about mosquitoes before, but there are trees too. You'd think that trees can't respond to climate change if they're if they are programmed genetically to grow in a certain range of temperatures. And those ranges of temperatures move. How does a tree possibly catch up to that? Because they can't get up and they can't pick up roots and go somewhere else, right? Oh, in Lord well, of the Rings, they did. But I tell you, <laughs> that's true. You didn't read those books, did you? I didn't read them, but I saw the movie. I can, I can, I can tell you that I saw the movie. The ants. <clears throat> that's right. But the seeds of the trees mm-hmm. are dispersed all over the place, and the reason why they have such narrow ranges is because they've been genetically selected for those ranges by the, the environment. So, if we know that these trees only grow in this certain environment, and now suddenly they're found somewhere else. Well, that must mean the environment changed, didn't it? There is a tree species that grows in Tasmania that has now almost grown off the island. That's how much the temperature has changed for this tree. Grown off the island? Yeah, because the the range at which this tree grows best has moved. Mm. You want a a real good local example that affects a lot of people that no one thinks about? Sure. And that is where you can grow food. Okay. So one of the crops that's best studied for this is the Pinot Noir grape. It has a two degree latitude range for growth. Two degrees above and two degrees below this range. Doesn't grow. They they do not grow. So you'll find Pinot Noir grapes along a certain gradient that you can find throughout the world. And the Pinot Noir grape growers know all about this because they can't move their farms. But the grapes said, I don't like it here anymore. I want to move. And you can't because you're stuck. So the Pinot Noir grape starts to do badly. And you start to miss out on those vintage years and you start to produce inferior quality wines. And the grape growers, and those are the people that have the most to lose by climate change issues in the immediate future. And that doesn't sound like a food group, but it's still indicative of the things that are happening. Is there any chance that we can change the course of climate change? Ah, uh, yes. This is kind of an aside well, just for curiosity. Well, we've already done that, haven't we? <laughs> I mean, climate change is real and climate change has always occurred and climate change will occur with or it's without true. people. It's happened with or without. Exactly, okay. yes. But. It's the, out of our hands. The rate <laughs> of climate change. Yes. That's different. So we have affected the rate, not whether climate is changing or not. We have affected yeah. the rate at which it changes. Yeah, so we do things that influence it, like by yeah. burning fossil fuels. Greenhouse and gases. Stuff. Greenhouse is what gases. Called. And but this has happened before, right? Oh, we've had lots of events where we've yeah. had huge amounts of greenhouse gases. So basically, we are not going to be able to alter the changes in climate, but we need to be aware of the consequences no, and try and. You just. Said something that I them. didn't agree with. What did you? I do think we, we can, can alter, alter them. The rate. 
So, so by making electric cars and so forth? Mm, I just a, don't think the world will ever agree to do something probably together. Probably a trivial issue. I think if we were to create more forest where we could mm-hmm. sequester more CO2, this would be a major... Yeah, but people need food, so they make farms. Now you got it. That's why I'm passionate about vertical farming. Yeah, I understand that. That's been always clear. But I don't know that you can change well, human behavior sufficiently to make yet. a difference. Hasn't happened yet. You know, you have had very good results. A lot of farms have gone up. I know what you're saying. But you need money. You need orders of magnitude more to make a change. We need 10% of the food produced by cities to be produced inside the city. And cities. that'll make a difference in the rate can, of warming? We can generate 340,000 square miles of forest if we did. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't need to farm that much. And that's half of what's been destroyed in Brazil already. Half. We could restore half of what's been destroyed. Are they building any vertical farms in Brazil? I wish. No, I wish. they continue no, to cut down the forest, right? Yeah, they are. Yeah, but it's a pretty sad situation. I just have to. But I'm not a pessimist. I know, no, of course. No, but you I, sound I like you're pessimistic. Well, t- generally, I'm optimistic especially with things that impact me directly. Right. But as far as getting the world to agree to do something, oh, I'm very pessimistic about well. that because everyone has their own agenda. But that's not this week in right. parasitism. No, it's not this week in parasitism. So we don't do picks of the week in parasitism. We do them in virology this week in virology. But I would like to do a pick You can of the week because in. it's the end of the year. All right. You can have a year-end pick. We'll do, we're going to do this So because this is something that I actually witnessed firsthand I was in attendance at the opening session for the American Society for Tropical Medicine or of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And this year's uh, meeting was held in Washington, D.C. And at this meeting, they uh, gave out awards for various things, the best this, the best that, you know, best clinical presentations, that sort of thing. And they gave one out for communications. This is called a communications award. And they gave it to Shelley G. XIE, who's a student at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Hmm. What she has devised is something akin to etch a sketch. Every kid knows what etch a sketch is. You know? yeah. <laughs> Shake it all up, it's fire and filings, and then you use a little magnet and you draw stuff with it and it, and it leaves a trail of, of the images. What she's done is sand paintings. She spreads sand out over a light box, an illuminated light box that's got a video camera focused on it. And as a story unfolds in sound, she animates it with sand it's paintings. Cool. And right before our eyes in 15 minutes, she told the story of uh, why it's important to interfere with the transmission of schistosomiasis. It was quite an amazing performance and in fact I think there's a YouTube version of it that I could highly recommend and in fact she performed this at the TEDx event in Livermore, California in June so you might be able to go to TEDx Livermore in June of this year 2013 and see her TEDx performance she was quite amazing she also won $2,000 which didn't hurt And she also plans on illustrating lots of other infectious diseases that relate to the interests of the membership of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So So I'm I'm really enthusiastic about that because it's a way of translating science to the public in an artistic fashion, which drives home the point of we should be paying more attention to people who are in most need of our help, and those are the people that are most disadvantaged throughout the world. And, of course, they're the ones that are catching schistosomiasis. So it was quite inspiring. All right. That'll be your year, yearly pick. <laughs> My yearly pick. Thanks. I want to do a couple of emails? Sure. First one is from Perry. Perry. Writes, greetings, Vincent and Dick. Hooray for finally mentioning G. Pulcrum. Gondolonema Pulcrum. In episode 62. <laughs> it was a human infection right uh and i think if i'm not mistaken it was in a resident of williamsburg virginia yeah this was one of our listeners sent in this article (coughs) how unusual yeah right (laughs) my most favorite parasite and one worthy of further discussion gondolonema 
As a diagnostic veterinary pathologist, uh, uh, I encounter this spiurid. Which is a nematode. In a, approximately... A variety of nematode. Really? In yeah. approximately one-third of dairy cows, wow. I autopsy. Wow. Wow. It is much more common than you surmised. Wow. I make a big deal out of its frequent occurrence, not because of its pathogenicity, essentially none, but because it is a paradigm organism. It, it insinuates itself in the esophageal mucosa, Correct. wriggling back and forth in the epithelial layer yep. as it advances. That yep. is why it is called the ribbon candy worm, uh -huh. thereby maintaining its hold and evading immune surveillance. The paradigm is that it is a beautiful example of an innocuous host-parasite relationship and the fact that most diagnosticians readily overlook it. Students of pathology all too often look but fail to observe. A South African veterinary pathologist told me that gongolonemiasis occurs in the mouth of poor rural children, presumably due to the ease with which they ingest an infected beetle intermediate. Kids eat beetles? Accidentally. Hmm. It has been some time since I last reviewed the literature, but I believe the nematode is worldwide and capable of parasitizing innumerable mammalian species. I enjoy your program, Biomedical Science Musings and Digressions. Keep up the good work. Where is he from? It doesn't say. Too bad, because I would like to know where it's endemic in cattle. It's The biggest outbreak I know of was from a, a sushi restaurant in northern Mexico where the people were getting gondolinema by eating raw fish. And they're not innocuous in people, as you can imagine. Significant parasites of domestic animals. Yeah, interesting. Human infection is rare. It's it since is its rare. discovery, fewer than 100 people have been reported. Right. But it's uh, animals, big deal. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Perry. Exactly. Kurt writes, well, sorry? No, no. Kurt writes, hello, Vincent and Dixon. Okay. First, let me start with some praise. I thoroughly enjoy all of the Twix casts, <laughs> but I appreciate TWIP in particular for its one-on-one -on -one format and the wealth of clinical experience and case studies that Dixon brings to bear in every episode. Oh, my. I finished Vincent's outstanding Coursera course recently, oh, looking great. forward to part two on that note, and it set me to wondering when Dixon is planning on doing a Coursera class on parasitism. I posted all my medical school courses up tonight, my mm -hmm. lectures for my mm -hmm. medical school course. Would you like to do a Coursera? If you show me how to do it, I can I'll be happy arrange to. it. It has to be done through Columbia. I, I would like to see. We would have to record. Maybe we could do an ecology course like that. You'd rather do ecology? Well, yeah. All right. I can help you. I know you can. But you have to be devoted. I have to be wanting you to be have to feel a few weeks, spend a few <laughs> weeks laying down the lectures on video, and then we put them up. Got it. Well, you but show me what you've done, and I'd, I'd be lot of happy. Work. It's a lot of work. I'm yeah. writing because I'm curious if the military has ever tried to weaponize helminths. I'm aware of past efforts by the military to weaponize practically everything, especially in the realm of pathogens running the spectrum from Y. pestis and smallpox to coccidiotes fungi. I wouldn't imagine that an attempt to weaponize helmets would be very successful, though. No. And attempts to imagine such a program are baffling at best. I am not aware of any, thank goodness. Would they be a good weapon? Well, I, I mean... what? Which one would you choose, first of all? A foodborne parasite. Probably the one I worked on for Trichinella? many Trichinosis, yeah, but... I know of an outbreak that occurred. Remember, I, I described this once in Norway. Uh, the Germans, when they were occupying Norway, mm -hmm. were told not to um, take away any of the food items from the villagers, but they were, they were receiving letters back from Germany that their own families were starving, so they disobeyed orders and killed some pigs and sent them back to Germany. And all of the pigs were infected with trichinella, and a lot of people died from that. Mm. So the Norwegians were getting back at the uh, the Germans for occupying their country. So if you were to use it as a weapon, where would you put it? No, I, I, I don't want to even in food? think about it. You put well, it food. you can't avoid it. It's in pork. So I, mean, it, I know, it but you could like add that. it to food so people would eat it, right? Yeah, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't that. work? Why? No, it's not, it's not, it doesn't survive very well outside of its nurse cells. Really? So 
It's not a weaponizable thing. I, I don't even want to think about that. It's so onerous. Don't worry. The NSA is not listening. <laughs> yes, sure they are. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> okay. Tell me what they're not listening to. <laughs> Keep up the outstanding work, gentlemen, and thanks again for your time and effort. Welcome. Kathy writes, Dear Professors De Pommier and Racaniello, I wanted to write you to thank you for taking the time to do these fantastic podcasts. TWIP was recommended to me by a former colleague with whom I worked in Professor Paul Dupre's virology lab at Queen's University, Belfast, before he moved to Boston University. Excellent. Since working with Professor Dupre, I got my PhD in molecular parasitology, and now I work in St. George's University of London on the NanoMal project, the link for which I've included which you may find interesting, nanomal.org. We're developing a handheld point-of-care diagnostic device for malaria Wow! that can give a diagnosis in under 20 minutes. Superb. But the really exciting part is it will be able to speciate and detect drug resistance conferring mutations Goodness. so an informed treatment choice can be made. Wow. So it's a cool website. Sounds like a TED Talk to me. Yep. Being a malariologist, I particularly enjoyed TWIP 35 with David Fiddock, and my interest was especially piqued when the contentious subject of artemisinin's mode of action was brought up. I thought this was about to be explored, but alas, it was not. (laughs) Of course, there are not enough hours in the day to debate that subject. If you are interested, however, we recently published an opinion article in Trends in Pharmacological Sciences on the subject which I have attached Professor Fiddick mentioned the heme hypothesis, but I am more in favor of the circa hypothesis, which postulates that artemisinins specifically inhibit the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium really? ATPase really? circa of the plasmodia parasites. I'll be darned. People may feel excuse me, people may feel that knowing the mode of action of a drug is purely academic. But as you are well aware, drug resistance is a serious problem for controlling malaria. And knowing how a drug works can help identify any mutations responsible and hopefully overcome resistance. True, true, I thought you needed to know the mode of action for the FDA to approve it. Uh, Sometimes they don't know it, though. Well, maybe in the U.S. only, but in other places not. I don't know. I don't either. Thank you again for all the time and effort you put into these podcasts. I have thoroughly enjoyed learning about different parasites, not to mention American history, and piscatorial pursuits, <laughs> and constantly recommend TWIP to my fellow parasitologists. I plan to start listening to TWIP, but it's been quite a while since my virology days. <laughs> I hope I can keep up. Don't let that stop you. I haven't had any virology days, so don't even... <laughs> You're sincerely <laughs> Don't Kathy. even think about it. Just do it. <laughs> oh, you can keep up for sure. We could try and keep it at a level that everyone... All right, the last one is from Lisa. Hello to Vincent Vincent and Dixon Twip. First, may I say that it's great you are putting such in-depth content out into the public domain. People such as yourselves with vast amounts of knowledge and years of experiences giving your knowledge freely is fantastic, and I applaud you for it. And not to mention your your presentation style is superb and funny. You're you're funny. No, no, we're... The micro world fascinates me. I bought a decent microscope last year. I've always wanted one, but after getting it to Twiv Twip Twim, I finally bought one. Fantastic. I've used it many times looking at pond life, mouth bacteria, poo from my dog Bella, who is female and very coprophagic (laughs) towards next door's cat. I basically put anything I dare on a slide to the horror of my fella. Our daughter loves it, too, with all the yucks and errs. <laughs> anyway, to cut a long story short, not that I have been waiting for a decent infection, but last week I contracted what I thought could only be described as food poisoning. After 24 hours of diarrhea, vomiting, burping, feeling bloated, cramps, I thought the best thing to do is check a stool sample naturally, as I had never been so ill. My thoughts were that it could be food poisoning, but I wasn't convinced after going back and hearing TWIP-16 Giardia Lamblia, <laughs> it rang a few bells. Right. On investigation, all could see no Giardia cysts, but I could see many uniform tubes with constrictions at the end. Being uniform and tube-like, my first thought was dog tapeworms? No. Or could it just simply be something I ate as it looks like plant matter? I'm sure Correct. if it's parasite debris, then Dixon can identify it in a jiffy. Well, also plant 
debris too. I mean, we have to know what the difference is. So the answer is there. Are, it's all plant debris that you sent us pictures of. Yeah. So you looked at these photographs, did. right? I did. And They're called artifacts. Dixon is very good at looking at these sorts of samples. I made right? my living at it once. So no parasites in there, just Not that debris. I saw. After searching, doesn't mean she didn't have any. Yes, of course. After searching Google to no avail, I feel I may need a copy of People, Parasites, and Plowshares for future use. Huh. It wouldn't help her diagnose, but no. it will help she you download a good atlas to of food parasites. yourself, yeah, to feed true. yourself. Yeah. What's a good atlas of parasitism? Well, there are many. Uh, really, there are. Yeah. Can you in name fact, one? In fact, even in our in our textbook, yeah, you have pictures. Parasitic diseases. There is an atlas in the back that's quite diagnostic. Is that book available? It is not. It is not. No, but I could send her a PDF copy of it if she wanted it. Okay. Well, um, Lisa, if you'd like, let us know. Here are a few... No, no. Yes, here are a few pictures of the two black forms. Seeing as though Dixon has seen many stool samples in his time, I thought it was a great opportunity to write in and express my <laughs> gratitude, plus a token of that appreciation. Keep up the good work, and thank you so much for bring, bringing science to the rabble. It's, I love that. <laughs> it's an absolutely personalized <laughs> note. I mean, I've never received a, a picture of a stool sample from a fan before, but I'm flattered. You should be. I'm flattered. You're not flatulent. <laughs> no, no, no. You're flattered. This is all I true. love this, bringing science to the rabble. But you well, and I are rabble I too, right? I wouldn't put it that way. They're not rabble. She did. I didn't. Just uninformed. TWIP can be found on iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash TWIP if you like what we do. And I know you're tired of me saying this. Go on over to iTunes and rate the show. Give it a couple of stars or comments. That helps to keep us visible. Because we want more people to subscribe, frankly. Because we love teaching you. Right, That's Dixon? All true. All true. Send us your questions and comments to twip at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier, where can people find you? Well, I have several sites. One is medicalecology.org. <laughs> there's a trichinella.org. And then there's verticalfarm.com. And Huffington Post. And the Huffington Post. I've only made you one should, so far. You should write more often for I the should, Huffington Post. But you know, if I don't have anything to say, I don't want to <laughs> just you fill not up have space. To say? Yeah, but was... it's just, you know, I don't chat like that. I'm not, that's not what I'm about. No, you don't have to chat. You have Sorry. to find something you're passionate about and write about well, it. Well, I've done that. Explain outbreaks to people. <laughs> We've done that here. Okay. <laughs> you are hard to convince. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You and are. You can, <laughs> and you can find me at virology.ws. The music that you hear at the beginning and end of TWIP, which I like, is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is it's parasitic. parasitic. should be back next year, right? That's right. Happy New Year, Dixon. And to you, Vincent.